As I sit at my window this summer afternoon, hawks are circling about my clearing. The tantivy of wild pigeons gives a voice to the air. A fish hawk dimples the glassy surface of the pond and brings up a fish. A mink steals out of the marsh before my door and seizes the frog by the shore. And for the last half hour, I have heard the rattle of railroad cars, now dying away and then reviving like the beat of a partridge, conveying travelers from Boston to the country. So Henry David Thoreau described Walden Pond in 1847. Now a modern ecologist would see and hear many of the same things Thoreau did, but he or she would describe them in a different way. Let's look at the modern ecological approach to nature. First, what is ecology? The word ecology comes from a Greek word meaning at home or places to live. Ecology is a branch of the broader field of biology. It is the branch that studies living creatures in their environment, living creatures at home. Or another way of putting it, ecologists study organisms in the totality of their relationships, one to another, and to the physical environment in which they live. Well, that's quite a mouthful. Let's take Walden Pond as an example. To the ecologist, Walden Pond is an example of an ecosystem. That is a complex web of relationships between living things and their environment that can be best described in graphic and quantitative ways. At the most basic level, we have energy. The relationships between the hawks and the pigeons, the pigeons and the pine boughs, the mink and the frog, and not least, the human and the railroad cars can all be usefully described in terms of energy flow. The physicist must enter here. In order to understand energy in ecosystems, we need to understand two basic laws of energy. One is the first law of thermodynamics. This says that energy can be changed from one form to another, but energy can never be created or destroyed. This first law is sometimes called the law of conservation of energy. The second law of thermodynamics points out that while you cannot create or destroy energy, energy always moves downhill in all its changes. That is, in every energy change you always lose something, and that lost something is energy as random heat, useful only for warming the universe. Another way to put this is, there is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. You never get as much work out of a machine as you put in. As for Walden Pond, it is the sun that provides the basic high-quality energy at the bottom of the energy pyramid. Ecologists can measure with a good deal of precision exactly how many kilocalories of solar energy the pond receives in a given day, week, month, or year. Ecologists have a name for organisms that can use that sunlight energy directly to power their own life activities. They are called producers. In the pond ecosystem, the producers are the pond weeds, the algae, and the other green plants that are able to use sunlight as a source of energy to produce food. The plants do this using a process we call photosynthesis. It turns out that careful measurements have shown that on the average, green producer plants are able to use only a small percentage of the sunlight that arrives each day somewhere between 1 and 5 percent, depending on the particular plant and ecosystem. This means that about 95 percent or more of the incoming energy is sent back to the air, the water, and the surrounding earth. And eventually this energy, heat energy now, is radiated back out to space, warming the universe. The producer plants use some of that manufactured food, concentrated sunlight you might call it, for their own growth and life activities. Some of the plant food, however, is eaten by the consumers. In ecosystem terminology, the consumers are living things, animals primarily, that convert the plant-produced food energy into new kinds of living structures and new kinds of living activities. Structures like eyes and ears, legs and wings, 
claws and brains. Activities like walking and swimming, eating and thinking. In the case of Walden Pond, the consumers are the hawks, the pigeons, the fish, the frogs, the microscopic water animals, and in his day, Henry David Thoreau. Each consumer may be only one link in what is called a food chain. The producers, we pointed out, are able to use only a few percent of the incoming sunlight energy. The consumers, it turns out, can do a little better in efficiency. They can convert about 10% of the producer food into consumer life energy. There is one more class of organisms that live at and in Walden Pond and that form a very important part of the ecosystem. These organisms are by far the most numerous and few people even know they exist. They are what ecologists call decomposers. In the water itself, and especially on the bottom of the pond, there live billions on billions of bacteria, molds, and other microscopic organisms that are able to decompose the dead plants and animals, as well as the waste from living plants and animals. In that process, they are able to use what remains of the locked up sun energy of the producers and consumers for their own growth, reproduction, and survival. Now, after the decomposers are through, all of the originally captured sun energy has been used and lost. Not destroyed, mind you, but lost. Unavailable anymore for any useful purpose. Sent back out to space to warm the universe. Energy flow is only one way that ecologists have for studying a given ecosystem. You can also do a detailed study of the way matter circulates within the ecosystem. Like energy, matter too can neither be created nor destroyed. But from the matter point of view, life is built of 20 to 30 essential kinds of atoms. Mostly built, as a matter of fact, of just six kinds of atoms. Some remember these important six by a mnemonic device, SP cone. Sulfur, phosphorus, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. All of the life important atoms circulate around in the ecosystem. The ecologists can trace their flow into and out of the air, water, and earth, into and out of the producer plants, the consumer animals, and the decomposer microorganisms. In the air, water, and soil, the atoms and the relatively simple compounds they make, things like carbon dioxide, water, inorganic acids, bases, and salts, are called the abiotic level of the ecosystem. Producer plants take up the abiotic chemicals and use them to build a bewildering variety of chemical compounds. Chemicals like sugars, starches, proteins, oils, enzymes, nucleic acids, and the literally billions of kinds of organic chemicals that go to make up the leaf, the stem, the seed, and the fruit. Now these plant-produced chemicals are then used by the consumer animals to make still more chemicals. Chemicals just as complex and even more incredibly organized together to make the functioning hawk, mink, frog, and human being. Which chemicals are then broken apart again and recycled back into the abiotic from which they came. This recycling is the job of the decomposers in every ecosystem. And these broad patterns of matter and energy cycling in the ecosystem provide a basic framework which ecologists can use in trying to understand the fascinating complexities of specific environments. In addition, ecologists have found other new ways to study ecosystems. They can investigate things like population, size, structure, and growth, the limiting factors and succession patterns, predator-prey and parasite-host relationships, species competition and cooperation, ecological indicators, and more. Some ecologists specialize in the study of freshwater springs and ponds like this in Silver Springs, Florida. Others specialize in marine ecology, in tropical rainforests, northern hardwood forests, prairies, agricultural regions, mountain slopes, 
deserts, bogs, and just about any place where life exists. The field is limited only by the limits of the Earth itself. That is a matter of fact, not by Earth either. Some ecologists are already beginning to plan and study a new field, space ecology. Ecology also overlaps with almost all other human sciences, and indeed with most human activities. A new field called ecological economics is an important example of this overlap. One of the questions, for instance, being asked today by ecological economists is, how can you value an ecosystem in money, in dollars and cents? We know, for instance, that wetlands are useful to cities and villages in many ways. They act as water storage areas. They act to prevent floods, to purify water by taking out toxic chemicals, to recharge underground water tables. Wetlands also provide wildlife and opportunities for recreational hunting and fishing. Even though it is often difficult to do, all of these benefits to human beings and more can be and are being measured now, not just in words, but in numbers, in dollars and cents. These financial figures can then be entered into hard-nosed economic analyses of profit and loss, balance sheet projections, and gross national product. Of course, some of the values that ecosystems provide are more difficult, if not impossible, to measure in dollars and cents. What is the monetary value, for instance, of a beautiful sunset, or of the pleasure many people take in the tonic of wildness? And for that matter, how do you measure the value of life to a rabbit, or deer, or wolf, quite apart from any connection to human beings? Probably the most important applications of ecology today are to those critical problems of human life aboard our spaceship Earth. And here come the questions that make the headlines. When you get to specific cases like acid rain, the greenhouse effect, like oil spills, nuclear waste, pesticide residues, the answers are not easy. This is partly because we just don't know enough yet. And partly because the answers often depend as much on what people value as what people know. For instance, Ecologists and naturalists can offer many reasons why a given ecosystem should be preserved as a wilderness, why no road should be built, and all but the most determined and hardy visitors kept out. In a democratic society, however, these reasons must be balanced against equally cogent ones that others may put forward for developing these same lands, for using the natural resources therein to create jobs, to increase wealth, and to overcome poverty. In some cases, ecologists can be more definitive about the facts. And at the very least, they can present the scientific evidence linking such and such an event. And they can tell us what confidence we can have in these links. Some ecologists, for instance, are spending a great deal of time right now studying the damage that acid rain may cause in forest and freshwater ecosystems in this country and abroad. Others are studying the possible effects of toxic waste leakage from old landfills, or the ecological consequences of cutting tropical rainforests in Brazil, or reducing the flow of water in the Colorado River. Others study ways to control pests like the zebra mussel, or lamprey eel, or the possible harm from genetically modified plants or animals. Still others try to trace the effects on ecosystems from oil spills, like that at Valdez, Alaska in 1989. Or the effects on Arctic wildlife from oil exploration and drilling. Or from nuclear power accidents, like those at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, or at Chernobyl in the Ukraine. Larger scale studies of the entire Earth biosphere are also being made today, using very large computers. The greenhouse effect, depletion of the ozone layer, nuclear winter, toxic waste in the ocean are just a few of the most important of these studies. Unfortunately, our knowledge of ecosystems is still very incomplete. In addition, there are so many variables that even the largest computers cannot take them into account. 
Despite these handicaps, ecologists are making progress and are providing important insights into the Earth's amazing life cycles. This work of ecologists, combined with the passion of environmentalists, has already led to much good news in the late 20th and early 21st century. Harmful air and water pollution of rural and urban ecosystems in the developed world of America, Europe, Australia, and Japan has been sharply controlled and reduced. And despite economic growth in the developed world, there is also more wilderness preservation going on today than ever before. Similar progress is also being made in large areas of the underdeveloped world in Asia, South America, and Africa, although many, many problems in many, many of these ecosystems remain severe. The rapid growth of human populations in the 19th and 20th centuries has itself caused great change in natural ecosystems. Today in the 21st century, human populations have stopped growing in the developed world and there is even some worry about population decline. In the poor parts of the world, population growth has been dramatically slowed and the prediction is that it too will reverse as the poor world gets richer. Similar stories can be told about natural resources. Contrary to common belief, natural resources that come directly out of our ecosystems, oil, timber, land, and minerals, are not in short supply in the 21st century, nor do most scientists expect them to be in the near or long-term future. And however the approach might vary, ecologists and naturalists and all concerned and intelligent citizens can agree that a new ethic about the Earth is slowly taking root. An ethic shared by a growing majority of Spaceship Earth's passengers and crew. Ecology means living at home. And we know now that our home is this blue-white spaceship. As the politician Adlai Stevenson once said, we travel together, passengers on a little spaceship, dependent on its vulnerable supplies of air and soil, preserved from annihilation only by the care, the work, and I will say the love we give our fragile craft. Or as the engineer Buckminster Fuller put it, environment to each must be all that is that isn't me. Universe in turn will be all that isn't me and me.